Presidential Commission of Inquiry serves summons on Arjuna Loisius to appear before the Commission on Wednesday. Petition filed at the Court of Appeal challenging High Court verdict in Silk Law trial. Proposed 20th Amendments to the Constitution ratified by the Eastern and Western Provincial Councils. Forecasters predict rains will intensify over the next three days. Associated Press reports Sri Lanka breaks UN sanctions against North Korea. US commemorates 16 years since the 9-11 attacks. Hello there, very good evening and welcome to your Prime Time News Bulletin. I'm Shane Silva. And I'm Jitendra Gunasena. Let's start off with the local stories in detail. Three newly appointed ambassadors to Sri Lanka presented credentials to President Maitri Pala Sirisena at the Presidential Secretariat today. Krug presented credentials as the new ambassador of the Republic of Estonia, Ohejuan Castenia Mendes as the new ambassador of Peru, and Chulamane Chatsuan as the new ambassador of Thailand. Addressing the three new ambassadors, President Maitripal of Sirisena said, the countries with excellent cordial relations must strengthen economic cooperation to ensure solid long-term bilateral ties. The president, referring to close bilateral relations with Sri Lanka and the countries represented by the new envoys, expressed confidence that they would strive to further strengthen bilateral friendship and cooperation in many areas including trade, investment and tourism. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksa visited the Valikala prison today to inquire into the well-being of imprisoned former secretary to the president, Lalit Viratunga, and former director general of the Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, Anusha Palpita. <laughs> It is not a crime. These people are just trying to portray it as a crime. This is just one incident in the country. I've issued around eight or ten other orders for which funds were allocated. These were all requests made by the general public. This was just one of the decisions that were taken. The bootlickers in the opposition and the ruling party constantly try to portray these matters as politically motivated to win elections. This was not done for the elections. It was done in March. <laughs> No, we had sent these to the respective provinces in advance, so the officials there had distributed them. No, that is a lie. What? No, this was my order. Even the judge here says that it was an order and not something done by force. I have not forced anything. I don't know, but when you say something to a secretary, it is an order. You don't just take a club and bash someone with it. An order is an order. The judge has clearly said there has been no benefit or theft through this. Then this should go to the elections commissioner. It is an elections case. If so, this is not where the punishment is imposed. This is with the lawyer's fee. He is not a criminal. We have the right to appeal this case. There are several legal implications here that need to be argued. I think we have the right to present them. Yes, those who accepted them are wrong and I too admit it if it was a crime, but it is not a crime. I asked the entire nation to forgive me. If I had imprisoned that man back then, this country could have been rescued from a major peril. Former Minister Mervyn Silva also arrived at the Valikola prison today. My uncle's son is in remand custody and I came to see him. Is that a problem? Well, we cannot go there now, can we? 
I have no reason to see him either. I just came to see my uncle's son. If you need more information, come by my house down Park Road. I will have a meal prepared as well. The Kalania Development Committee meeting was held under the auspices of Field Marshal Minister Sarath Fonseca today. Now, following the meeting, Field Marshal Minister Sarath Fonseca expressed his views on the verdict given on the silk cloth scam. No one can escape from the law claiming that they did it on someone else's command. It is wrong if someone rapes a woman just because the leader instructed them to. Everyone who was with him were involved in the fraudulent activities. Punishment should be given to the place where the seed was planted. Mahindraj Paksib has publicly admitted that it was done based on his instruction. 600 million rupees of the TRC is not his father's. Lord Buddha did not preach to help someone by stealing from someone else. Although Mahindra Rajpaksa goes to temples carrying flowers for offering, he thinks that helping someone by stealing from someone else is a good deed. Minister, everyone arrested on corruption allegations go into prison smiling, but after that they end up in the prison's hospital. Yes, they get that benefit if they are arrested over charges of corruption. I was arrested. I was arrested for lies, so I did not get that benefit. War heroes stage protests everywhere in the country. Are they really war heroes? There are around 100 to 150 working for money. They use these people to protest. You should not misinterpret it as protesting everywhere in the country. A group of civil activists and Deputy Minister Ranjan Ramanayaka presented a letter to the Secretary of the Ministry of Health today. Through this letter, the group requested that the existing transfer order for the Acting Chief Medical Officer of the Varikala Prison, Dr. Nirmali Tenuara, be executed immediately. When an inmate sentenced to rigorous imprisonment is first brought to the prison, the first order of business is to issue a prison number and take a photograph following which the inmate is referred to the doctor on duty at the medical center. However, in their letter, the group of activists and the deputy minister claim that Dr. Nirmali Tenwara had met with Anusha Palpita and Lalit Viratunga prior to this and had signed two tickets for them to be admitted to the prison hospital. The group notes that such an incident has not been reported in the history of the prison. Furthermore, the group claims that Dr. Tenuvara had remained at the premises until 9 p.m. waiting for the two inmates. The group notes that Dr. Tenuvara had arrived at the prison on the morning of the 8th of September, that is the very next day, and had immediately acted in violation of procedure to admit inmates B-18068 and B-18069 to the prison hospital as patients number 7401 and 7402. Through their letter, the group requests that, considering these facts, Dr. Tenuvara's transfer to the National Hospital in Colombo should be executed immediately. Speaking at an event held in Hambantara today, Minister Sajid Premadasa had this to say on the Silrevi trial. I have never seen the distribution of silk cloth as a crime, but the crime committed here was that silk cloth was distributed in order to buy votes. Silk cloth was distributed to buy votes to ensure victory at the presidential election. They sold Buddhism and the Sambuddha Jayanti to politics for a dream to enter temple trees and the president's house for a third term. Is it ethical or correct to distribute silk cloth using public funds during an election? Is it correct? Is this how a country should be run? Minister Premadasa made these observations during an event held to mark the laying of the foundation stone for a multi-purpose building in Tissa Mahara Mahamantota. Minister of Megapolis and Western Development Partly Champakaranvaka was also present at the occasion. Several views were expressed on the silk cloth saga today. The joint opposition should ask for forgiveness, not for negotiations. This silk cloth was distributed during the concluded presidential election. There is nothing they did not do to try and secure victory for Mahindra Rajpaksa. They used public funds to bring busloads of people to the president's house and feed them. That is how they campaigned. They did not distribute silk cloths so that Buddhists could attend Nirvana. 
the silk cloth was distributed during an election. At the time, the elections commissioner went to several locations and prevented this. Now Mahinda is saying that he stood by the Buddhist. He did not stand by the Buddhist. This is not a verdict that was given by the government. It was a verdict given by the courts following a thorough investigation. Pandulagunavadin is now trying to collect money for the fine, rupee by rupee. I say that they should fall at the feet of the people and seek for forgiveness for the crimes they have committed. There is a question as to whether the verdict handed down could change within a week or two. Today the president who kept him in the post of secretary is admitting that he is the one who issued the order and that this fate should be his. We believe that if he is accepting responsibility for it, he should suffer the same punishment. If he was an official with a conscience, he could have resigned his positions at the very least. This is public money and it is no small sum. It was 600 million rupees. We wonder how people who stole 600 million rupees only have to pay 100 million in compensation. Attorneys of former secretary to the president, Lalit Virutunga, and former director general of the Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, Anusha Palpita, who were imprisoned, have submitted a petition to the Court of Appeal challenging the High Court ruling. The petitions were submitted to the Court of Appeal requesting for an acquittal in connection to the charges on the silk cloth case. They have also requested the High Court to annul the sentence of three years rigorous imprisonment given on the 7th of this month. The petitioners point out that the High Court judge has delivered a verdict in contravention of except legal norms and disregarding precedents. Summons have been issued on Arjuna Lorsius to appear before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. Zulfik Farzan reports on Bondgate. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry has issued summons on Arjun Aloysius of the Perpetual Group and the Chairman of Perpetual Capital, which is the holding company of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, to appear before the Commission on Wednesday morning to provide evidence in relation to the investigations undertaken by the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. The Commission informed his attorney, President's Counsel Gamani Marpana, that Arjun Aloysius must comply with the summons. If not, there will be consequences. Arjun Aloysius provided a statement to the detectives of the CID assisting the commission for the fifth day. President's counsel, Garmini Marapana, who appears for Arjun Aloysius, said his client is not willing to give evidence before the commission. He quoted rulings made in previous occasions and pointed out to the commission that a person accused of wrongdoing cannot give evidence before a commission and witnesses appearing before the commission must be given immunity. He said if the commission calls Aloysius as a witness against his wish, Aloysius must have witness immunity. In response, Senior Additional Solicitor General Dapula Gilibera stated as per the warrant issued on the commission, it is empowered to identify wrongdoing and wrongdoers and to make recommendations on how it needs to be dealt with. He added, as Aloysius is a necessary and material witness for the Commission, his evidence would enable the Commission to determine any wrongdoing and wrongdoers. Highlighting the people await the outcome of the Commission on wrongdoing and those responsible for this robbery, Delivera said Aloysius' evidence will be relevant to identify other parties and individuals responsible for this robbery. Delivera said in phone recordings placed before the Commission, Aloysius is heard mentioning people in powerful places, people from the public debt department and state banks on vital information. Delivera said if Arjun Aloysius is not called, the Presidential Commission has failed in its duty, mandate and warrant. Noting that the President appointed the Commission on National Interest, Delivera stated Arjun Mahendran, Arjun Aloysius and others whom he did not wish to name must step into the box. President's counsel Gamini Marapana said he needs to protect his client's rights and Arjun Aloysius must have access to a court of law. Delivera questioned the counsel whether it was a threat. The commission said it will not cross any lines and is bound to complete the purpose of the mandate. Justice Prasanna Jayawardana said all must assist the commission in reporting the facts and added the commission is yet to find any fact or wrongdoing in relation to the matter. He noted for the past two years various persons have been making quote-unquote rubbish statements while it took the commission around six months to study this process.
In relation to the submissions made by Aloysius's counsel, the Commission said it will make an order on Wednesday considering the facts presented. The CEO of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Kasun Palisena, was cross-examined today as well. Deputy Solicitor General Melinda Gunetilaka pointed out that when Perpetual Treasuries Limited entered into securities transactions with Perpetual Capital Holdings, Perpetual Asset Management and WM Mendis & Company Limited, all profits moved to the group companies while PTL incurred a loss. He stated PTL did all these transactions under the instructions of Arjun Aloysius as all transactions are between companies of which Aloysius is the beneficial owner. From the 1st of February 2015 to 30th September 2016, the trading gains for all bonds by the PTL group companies was just over 900 million rupees. Is there a connection between the allegations of corruption during the past regime and those being exposed today? Is there a pattern to how public funds are being siphoned off by the powers that be? This special revelation is about a particular document that may have set the precedent to this pattern of corruption. On the 27th of March 2013, Mahindra Rajapaksa, as the then Minister of Finance, submitted a cabinet paper with his observations on the decision of Sri Lankan Airlines to obtain a number of aircraft at a high price. The cabinet paper stated that Sri Lankan Airlines is a public company which operates under its own board of directors and therefore the right to purchase aircraft is vested with its chairman, CEO and the board of directors. This cabinet paper set a precedent for other state-owned companies to circumvent cabinet approval in the procurement process. Taking this as an example in 2013, Litro Gas Lanka Limited went on to sign a deal to purchase 320,000 metric tons of LP gas in contravention to established procurement processes. The recommended price for a metric ton of LP gas as issued by the cabinet appointed procurement committee in line with the national procurement policy was $126. Even though Shell Gas had been prepared to present competitive bids to supply LP gas for the period between 2013 and 2015, Litro Gas agreed to award the right to supply LP gas to Oman Trading International once again, this time at a price of between $135 and $140 per metric ton. The chairman of Litro Gas Lanka Limited at the time was Garmini Senarath, while Piyadasa Kudabalege was serving as the MD and CEO of the company. Although allegations of financial irregularity were leveled against these individuals prior to the 2015 election, action is yet to be taken against them. They are also no longer in the media spotlight. Of the large number of dubious transactions that took place under the previous administration, a majority of them follow this trend of circumventing established government procedure. The hedging deal, the coal tender, the power purchasing agreement, with the Caravella Pitya plant through West Coast Power are some examples of such transactions. The current government was voted into power on a clear anti-corruption platform. But the trend established under the previous regime seems to be followed to a T with the ICTA scandal, the Central Highway scam and the bond scam all being prime examples of this. The question is why aren't attempts at redress, such as the National Procurement Commission and the Audit Bill, enacted immediately in order to protect the nation from this relentless barrage of corruption? Stay tuned for more on this disturbing pattern on News First soon. The latest example of officials disregarding the national procurement process is the contract for the construction of the third phase of the Central Expressway. This is the latest revelation on this project. While the tender process was underway for construction of the Central Expressway, Subject Minister Lakshman Kiriala submitted a remarkable cabinet paper. The cabinet paper which was submitted on the 2nd of December 2016 calls for the competitive tender procedure to be brought to an immediate halt. In addition, the cabinet paper has also sought approval for the minister to begin talks with Fujita Daiwa House, one of the bidders involved in the tender process. However, the tender committee ruled that Fujita Corp was not suited to handle such a contract. Thereafter, Lakshman Kiriala proposed that the contract be awarded to a consortium between Taisei Corp, the winner of the bid, and Fujita Corp. He claimed that this was based on request of the Japanese government. 
on whose behest was the proper procedure violated and is there a vested interest behind officials favoring one particular company the proposed 20th amendment to the constitution was ratified by the eastern and western provincial councils today the 20th amendment was ratified when the bill was taken up for a vote at the western provincial council today with 45 councillors voting for and 28 voting against four members of the council abstained from voting a special sitting of the eastern provincial council was held at 9:30 am today to vote on the proposed 20th amendment however due to the lack of quorum the chairman was made to postpone the sitting to 11 am only one councillor from the ruling party and three councillors from the opposition were present at the time When the council reconvened at 11 a.m., Chairman Chandradas Agalapati was forced to postpone the sitting to 1 p.m. as the 13 members required for quorum were not present. When the vote was eventually taken up, 24 councillors voted for the amendment while 8 voted against. The proposed 20th amendment has been ratified by 3 provincial councils thus far and has been rejected by 3. The Lanka Sama Samaj Party convened a media briefing today. When we look at the constitutional amendment, we see that the restructuring of the constitution has been halted. You know that the proposals on restructuring the constitution should be put forward after a two-third majority is passed. That should be passed in parliament with a two-third majority even if it is not put up for a public referendum. Given the current situation where the SLFP and the UNP are pulling in two different directions, you cannot restructure the constitution. ආණ්ඩුක්‍රම ව්‍යවස්ථාවට ප්‍රතිසංස්කරණ ගෙනෙන්නට පුළුවන් කමක් නැහැ. Speaking at a public rally held in Maharagama last evening, Anurag Kumar Disanayaka, the leader of the Janata Vimukti Peramuna, had this to say. Mahindra Rajapaksa, who was not agitated even in the face of the dengue epidemic, was immensely troubled as soon as Lalit Veeratunga was arrested and we saw how he immediately came to parliament and held discussions with Ranil Vikramasinghe in his room. I heard Mahindra Rajapaksa say on stage that even Ranil Vikramasinghe was surprised by the verdict. It was not only Ranil, even we were surprised, but for different reasons. Ranil was surprised because of the punishment. Not only should he be surprised, he should be afraid. If the investigation into the bond scam continues in this way, Ranil Vikramasinghe should be afraid too. not just surprised there is an unwarranted interference in the court of appeal behind this meeting it is extremely clear that this political garbage is continuing through backroom deals and secret meetings united states called for a vote today on new un sanctions against north korea this comes following reports from the associated press that states sri lanka is amongst a number of countries violating current sanctions AP reports that according to UN experts North Korea illegally exported coal, iron and other commodities worth at least 270 million US dollars to China and other countries including India, Malaysia and Sri Lanka in the 6 months period ending in early August in violation of UN sanctions. The experts monitoring sanctions said in a report released Saturday that Kim Jong Un's government continues to flout sanctions on commodities as well as an arms embargo and restrictions on shipping and financial services. President Maithripala Sirisena is likely to face tough questions relating to this shocking revelation during his visit to New York for the UN General Assembly next week. Relations between Sri Lanka and the UN were extremely difficult during the Rajapaksa regime. Violations of UN sanctions by this government is likely to set back the good relationship that has been developed during the last 2 years. Some time ago during the last last regime we went into the international record as a country which has violated human rights. and our name our the name of our country was was in a very leading place now we are also leading in corrupt activities corrupt businesses and illegal uh, deals that are internationally carried out and we our name appears in this international report it's a very bad state of affairs and i think this has this situation has arisen due to the many and the several deals that have been taking place which have been exposed 
regularly on a very regular basis under the uh, current uh, under the current uh, situation Residents of 21 villages belonging to the Tambutte government divisional secretariat state that their crops are in great danger since of late due to the threat of wild elephants. Residents of several villages including Solama, Mahialava and Nelumtottama engage in a protest today demanding compensation for their damaged crops. The protesters who made their way to the Andhra Pradesh district secretariat office demanded that the government take immediate measures to provide them with relief. The protesters who engaged in this protest for about an hour thereafter met with the additional district secretary who said that he will speak to the wildlife department officials about setting up an electric fence. Members of the All Ceylon Peasants Federation also joined the protest. Water has not been provided for the past three years for cultivation. The crops that are grown with the greatest difficulty are being destroyed by wild elephants. We were given notice on the 28th of last month that steps will be taken to mitigate this problem. However, this was cancelled as the required approvals had not been provided. A seminar organized by the Ceylon Institute of Chemistry was held in Colombo today. The seminar focused on the untapped potential of the sugar industry in national development. Speaking at the event, Lakshman Sirivathan, the executive director of the Pathfinder Foundation, Pathfinder Foundation rather, highlighted certain shortcomings in the national economic policy. We have followed from 1948, especially beginning from 1950s, worst possible economic policies in this country. That is, introduce government inter intervention, destroy the private initiatives. That was the pathetic situation in this country. The so-called right-wing government didn't have the courage until 1977, certain liberalization takes place, still keeping some of these decadent, inefficient, corrupt government institutions. Hambathur put, someone has said that 99 year lease is too long. It should have been 50, it should have been 30, whatever. Foreign investor won't come into a very large infrastructure development project unless the pay back period is very, because it's pay back period is very low. It's, it's, you won't invest in something to lose money. The Pacific Airlift Rally 2017, which is an Air Force-sponsored airlift symposium involving countries of the Indo-Asia Pacific region, commenced today. The Pacific Airlift Rally will be held until the 15th of this month in the Katunayaka and Ampara airspace. The event is organized by the PACAF, which is the air component of the United States Pacific Command with a selected air force in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. I am happy to hear and inform you that this exercise will continue to take place every other year. I believe that every country is fighting its own war when it comes to national disasters and humanitarian relief operations. That is precisely why this exercise is of paramount importance. By exercises such as this, I believe that all participating countries will emerge as victors. To take this opportunity, to extend my heartfelt thanks to the U.S. government and the PACAF in being generous enough to host this exercise in Sri Lanka. Tonight on Face the Nation, lawyers, economists and bankers take up financial irregularities, tender procedures, the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, the judiciary and government. Await attorney at law Krishma Varnasurya, former uh, Commissioner Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission Dr. Pratibha Mahanamaheva, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank Dr. W. A. Vijay Wadhana and senior banker Rusi Rupalathendakun on Face the Nation at 9.30 on TV1. Well, that's all the news we have for you for tonight. For the Newswoods team, I'm Jithendri Gunasena. And I'm Shane Silva. Take care and good night.